Hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Knowing Your Value as a CNA. I'm Lori Porter and I serve as CEO for the National Association of Healthcare Assistants, the only CNA association, National CNA Association. And for over 40 years, I've heard CNAs referred to as the backbone of healthcare. As a matter of fact, I just read it in an article again a few minutes ago. However, we place so much value, I mean, we put place our value or uh, tally our value in comparison to the size of our paychecks. So oftentimes CNAs feel they're not valued because they're not paid a great wage. If I, ha if I did that, I'd have to say that uh, I'm of little or no value today because my salary is roughly $30,000 a year. And when we compare that to other CEOs of national associations, they make way over $100,000 a year. However, knowing this, I still feel that I have a great deal of value. I work very hard on your behalf, the team here at NACA. We value you and we want you to value yourself. It took me a long time to understand my own value and to appreciate myself for being a CNA, an advocate for CNAs, and an advocate for the residents, and really making a difference in this world. That has value. I am valuable and you are valuable. Let's talk about pay for just a second, because pay is a logical benefit that anyone can understand. I mean, it's, it's a clear cut, you're gonna get X amount of dollars per hour. You keep track of your hours, you can calculate your very own paycheck. And we know that, you know, there's, there's everyone will agree, I've never found a single person who is a leader in healthcare who has ever said that CNAs should be paid less. No one ever says that. So if that's the true, if, I mean, if that's true, why does our pay not increase? If we're the backbone, why is pay not increasing? Well, here's the thing, it is. And it will continue to do so, mark my words. I'm seeing it every day in the news and I'm working around the country talking with uh, employers and CNAs and things are starting to move in the right direction. But your value is not tied up in your pay or else I couldn't value myself. And, you know, here in CNA week, you know, unfortunately, we're hearing from a lot of our CNA members who work for companies that have done nothing to recognize them this week. Well, NACA has been busy since last Thursday when CNA week began, and I did the first webinar, Advocating for Yourself. Uh, this is our final day of our week, and um, I'm sad to see it go, but I wanted to at least end today with a big bang. And that big bang is making sure you know your value as a CNA. Today, I'm going to have a special guest with me in just a few minutes that I'm happy to be happy to introduce to you all. And he and I are going to have a conversation about your value. And he will speak directly to those of you that are watching today and those of you that join us later for the recording. Uh, I think you're very much going to enjoy the presentation today. But let me illustrate your value in, a, in about three different um, bulleted point areas. CNAs provide more than 90% of the direct patient care elders receive. This is especially true in our nation's nursing homes. CNAs also make up the largest employee group. And there are currently nearly 200,000 openings in America for CNAs. When we speak of value, there is value, 90% of the direct patient care. Imagine you're holding people's lives in the palms of your hand and their rehabilitation, their quality of care is really in your hands. And there's all kinds of challenges you face out there. We spoke of those on the first webinar. And um, 
you know, I want you to use that template if you saw it. If you weren't on that webinar, go back and watch it because it gives you a template for how to advocate for yourself at work. So if all these things are true, once again, you might turn back to, then why are we paid so little? I'll address that, uh, but I really think that's a seminar in itself. So I would rather just put a pin in it and do a webinar sometime in the future on CNA pay and what's happening and where things are going and re and re um, as a result of the efforts. We all know residents in nursing homes and around, across the country in home care and hospice are suffering. And you're the only ones with the knowledge to fix it, but you don't believe people listen. We work hard here at NACA to ensure your name is never forgotten and that we can put an end to this shortage, that we can improve our outcomes we can build stronger teams as CNAs and that we can support one another. It is lonely out there for CNAs who don't support one another, who aren't on a team. We're all too quick to tear down another CNA when what we really need to do is work to find ways to support one another. I probably don't work like you do, you probably don't work like I do, but as long as we're both committed as CNAs to the care we provide, then that is all that can be expected to, of us is to be committed. I want to talk uh, now as I bring in um, uh, Dr. Nazir. He, I'll tell you who values you in healthcare. The physicians value you. The physicians who serve as medical directors at your work. Today, as I've already said, my special guest is Dr. Arif Nazir. He is a specialist of, law, of internal medicine and geriatric care. Very few physicians are specialists in geriatric care in this nation. Dr. Nazir became Signature Health's Chief Medical Officer in January 2016. He's also received recognition for his work in implementing Indiana's nursing home value-based purchasing system and his extraordinary work as a faculty member of Indiana University where he excelled in research education, and leadership in both post-acute and long-term care settings. Welcome, Dr. Nazir, and thank you so much for joining us today. And why don't you start out talking a little bit about the importance of CNAs and what they mean to you? Hey, Lori, thank you so much. I was really, really enjoying listening to you, uh, honestly, uh, and totally forgot that I was, I'm a speaker too. So uh, <laughs> I really could listen to you for the whole hour, uh, honestly. Uh, so, and thank you for giving me a voice here on such an important day and such an important platform. And man, I have so much to say uh, about the value of CNAs. Um, so, you know, let me just begin that I started working as a, uh, as a nursing home physician in 2004. And uh, I had no intention to work in nursing homes at that point. I, I was providing primary care services in rural Michigan uh, in a small, uh, federally uh, uh, qualified healthcare center. And uh, the administrator came to me and said, hey, Dr. Nazir, our nursing home lost our medical director. Do you want to come and provide care? And I was having a comfortable life, you know, providing care as a family care doctor in the, in, in, uh, as an internal medicine doctor in the clinic. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a try. So I still remember the first day I entered the nursing home knowing nothing. It was like after my work hour, it was like 6 p.m. kind of time. It was like a kind of a gloomy day and it was dark nursing home. And, and I got like really scared. Like, what the heck I'm doing here? I have no idea where I'm going to start, you know, what to do, how would to approach and guess who was the first person who approached me? It was a very welcoming CNA uh, who's like, hey, can I help you? And the moment I told her that, hey, uh, my name is Dr. Nazir, I'm here to see, and um, some of my first day, man, her face glowed. Uh, and since then we became the best partner. And she literally became my first teacher of nursing home medicine. And from there on that day, I always sought her. I was like, you know, you know, I don't want to, you know, say her name there at this point. Let's say her name was Julie, but Julie was the person I was seeking the moment I, because, you know, she just brought me a comfort because she knew pretty much everything that was going on with my patients would guide me and hold my hand and take me to that patient room and that patient room. But, you know, so I kind of 
really, I mean, my concept of uh, it was not even for out for a question that what value CNA provide to me, they were absolutely the backbone of that healthcare system. And then, of course, I got introduced to the nurses. Uh, the problem with nurses were that in that nursing home and to, to this day, we had so much turnover on the nursing side that it was very hard for me to connect with them in context of one patient. But CNAs, you know, who have who have a less of a turnover, who are so much more committed to those patients, uh, kind of always became my partner in whenever I wanted to discuss really in-depth, meaningful patient care issues. So let me just stop here uh, because that was just such a clear indication to me that what value uh, CNS bring to, to this healthcare system. Well, thank you for that. And I do have a quick question and follow-up. Have you met other Julies? Many, many other Julies. So, so when I joined as a signature healthcare chief medical officer, one thing I really wanted to do and was before pandemic, when you could do that freely, and now finally you're getting to the point you can, I really, really made it a point to visit as many facilities as I could. And one thing which I had on the agenda was to really get a formal feedback uh, and uh, education from our frontline. So I actually created this informal survey and I at least made, and the purpose of the survey was that I really wanted to formalize on making sure that I do spend a significant time talking to the CNAs and at least talking to them about these five things. I mean, and they could, I mean, they could go beyond and talk other things. So the, if things were like, but one of the most important things on there was, why do you do what you do? Because to me, it was always, man, this job is the toughest job. It requires the most commitment. It is the most under-recognized, and it barely pays enough. Why do these people do what they do? And, and you know, I am a big, you know, I'm a big student of behavioral economics. I'm very intrigued by, like, why people do what they do, what motivates them, what inspires them. And, you know... 15 years ago, I used to believe that money is everything and you give people more money, they do work, more work. So I was like, what, with this limited pay, why these people are so committed to these patients? So I really made the formal part of my inquiry. Uh, and uh, then I started finding so many Julies. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those surveys uh, and what, what I found through those surveys. But uh, yes, I found so many uh, Julies. That's the answer. Well, wonderful. How about we, uh, those of you that are tuned in today, if you want to chat in um, any questions at all for Dr. Nazir or myself throughout this uh, webinar, feel free to, but um, maybe if you are so inclined, you could chat in on why you do what you do. Just as Dr. Nazir was saying, what keeps you there? Why do you do what you do? And um, because we know the pay is low, we know the value is not always shown to you that you deserve. So, Feel free to chat that in. Let's go ahead, Dr. Nazir, and it brings me, your, your comments uh, already have brought me to a question we get often here. Being that you're a physician, I don't want to put you on the spot on policy and things like that uh, in my questioning, but one thing we often hear is CNAs notice when a resident has had a significant change in condition. What should they do if they can't get anyone in leadership to go see, go look, go check? Is there anything to in me, your mind what they would do next? Yeah, I mean, I think in idea, I, I, of course, there are sad state of affairs in some nursing homes where, you know, you don't have a good uh, structure where a committed CNA just cannot find a good partnering healthcare team member, be it a physician or a committed nurse in that building. And I don't know what to say <laughs> in, in that sad state of affairs. I mean, that's an absolutely broken healthcare system. And that nursing home, if that's the, if that's their norm, they shouldn't even exist. To me, that's like the most health, most harmful healthcare environment where a CNA cannot find a committed team member to come and help them really address that issue. But in, 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 a, in a reasonable average or above average nursing homes, I mean, that's why, uh, you know, we have a formal system like stop and watch, right? I mean, it's, you know, we have to be very proactive in really looking at some of the key attributes of our residents, what their cognition is today, or what their appetite today, uh, what their bowel movements like today, you know, what, what they, how, they, how are they welcoming or starting their day this morning, right? Those little flags, which CNAs are really master at, could be the game changer in providing good outcomes in our nursing home. So, so things like stop and watch, or you, don't, you don't have to use stop and watch. For a lot of experienced CNAs, they don't need a tool. I mean, they are really groomed that way. Way, that is their second nature on sensing that Mrs. Smith just woke at a, 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 usually she wakes up on the right side. Today, she woke up on the left side. What the heck is going on? So they're so observant. 
So I think the moment they notice something like that proactively, they have to engage either a senior supervisor CNA if they're new themselves, or absolutely have enough confidence to be able to go to their charge nurse and bring that to their attention. Of course, you know, the charge nurse can be busy. There may be so many things going on, but, you know, I think the culture of the building should be that when something is sensed that way, everything needs to be focused on that acute change of condition. And I, I always empowered my CNAs by giving them my cell phone number or their ability to directly call me as a physician. To me, that CNA physician partnership can really change the game, honestly. So there, yeah. That is incredible because we do hear a lot. I think you and I might have spoke of this in one of our earlier meetings about, you know, CNAs feeling like they would love to have a relationship with the medical director. And they often ask us, why don't they talk to us? Because we know the residents better. And I, you know, I, I explain it as a protocol of how physicians orders and things like that work by regulatory and legal standards. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any reason a CNA can't approach the medical director when he's in the facility? So let me share with you a little bit about that survey. So I did that survey and I put one question. The first question on it is, why do you do what do you do? So I'll tell you a little bit later on what I found on that. But let's put that aside. My second question was about the relationship with the physicians. And I was like, it was, I am comfortable talking to my physicians. No uh, uh, somewhat, not at all, or whatever. So I gave them this Likert scale. And I used to get a few uh, CNS together in every nursing home I went to, and they did that Likert scale, and I aggregated. And hands down, I was disappointed and heartbroken that they believed clearly that they got nothing. They did not have access to physicians. And to me, that was not my working style. So somehow I had lived in this very artificial bubble of a world where I thought that there was and empowerment of our CNAs that they could easily approach physicians. By the way, when I go to talk to physicians about it, they see they say nothing in that. They're like, absolutely, they should. I don't know why I don't get calls from my CNA. So I think there's a big miscommunication how we set up our structures. I think administrators and DONs can play a better role. Chief medical officers like me can play a better role in reminding our CNAs that absolutely you have 100% access to your physicians. You should have their cell phone. You should have, a, a, you know, you should have their... Uh, any system to approach your physicians, you should have that. If you aren't, of course, there has to be a protocol. Yeah, go ahead and talk to your nurse who's there. And if, But if you're not getting what you need from them, you absolutely should have, should have the ability. You are as an important healthcare team member as the DON, as the charge nurse. You know, you absolutely have the same chair seat on the table. So yes, so to me, and to me, whenever I talk to medical directors, I always have this conversation with them and, say, and, and really try to encourage them build a direct relationship with your CNA. So that survey, when I started doing that survey, officially I was disappointed because our healthcare system is a failure in that regard, that every CNA thought that for some reason or the other, they were not supposed to call the medical, they have no approach to them. That's why nurses were there for, their job was just to go to the nurses. So to me, that was the most lowest hanging fruit in my opinion, from my eyes, that I can fix as a physician leader is to remind our physicians that we need to equip our CNAs so that they can come directly to us. And let me tell you one thing, uh, is that the most, the biggest epiphany in for my personal leadership was, happened to me in a nursing home. So one day I went to this, uh, my nursing home, at, uh, which was a beautiful nursing home in, the, in the downtown Indianapolis, West Park Rehab, one of my favorite places where I learned all my geriatrics with the help of my nurse practitioner partner and with my CNA and my nursing partners. That's how I learned geriatrics. And so one day I was having this conversation with my assistant DON and I said, Hey, I'm going to just call her Julie again. Hey, Julie, it's strange. When I am at the East unit, I can have good communication with the nursing staff and the CNAs, but on the West unit, uh, the, the CNA is kind of like a little bit hesitant to talk to me. And then she started laughing at looking at me and she smiled. I said, why are you smiling? She said, Dr. Nazir, look at you. You have, you have a white coat on, you have a stethoscope dangling from your neck. You have this badge saying, associate professor of geriatrics, Indiana University, and you think that anybody will come and approach you? And that was the biggest epiphany for me is that we have created such barriers through perceptions around our own team members. And that was the last month when I ever wore a white coat in a nursing home. I got rid of a white coat, got rid of badges, because to me, 
And by the way, white coats and, and dangling stethoscope, by the way, spread infections too. We know that. So there are other reasons too to get rid of those things. But to me, that was an understanding that, hey, I have so much more to do to empower our nursing teams and the CNA so that I can be approachable to them. It's my fault. So I, you know, we as physicians have all we can do to make sure that we are approachable to our team members, particularly our CNAs. Absolutely. I had to chuckle, Dr. Because uh, on my 21st day as a CNA, I showed up in a doctor coat, <laughs> a stethoscope, <laughs> a pocket protector with some scissors and tape. I didn't even make it till the time to the time clock till I heard one nurse aide say to another, look at her. She thinks she's a doctor. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can imagine. So I had to give up my doctor coat and my stethoscope. <laughs> but anyway, because uh, I've always told CNAs they have the right to look as professional as they want to. But that is a great point. And I hope those that are listening today and watch later really picked up on what you said about their position, what they mean to you. So if you could go into that a, just a little bit more, and in your opinion, how do CNAs really contribute to the health and well-being of your patients or their patients? Oh my God, immensely, immensely, right? I mean, the thing is that if I do not have, uh, you know, competent and trustworthy CNAs working for me, for my patients, what will I have to do? I will have to go to the building you know, every hour, <laughs> right? right? Because I know that my my nurses are so busy uh, because meeting all those regulatory checklists we have created for our nurses, right? All the medication necessary or unnecessary, they have to dole out and all those little things they have to do to make sure that the surveyors are happy. And, you know, so in all that distracting world, guess who's paying the most attention? It is the CNAs, right? They are the ones who are building this relationship with the patient, the resident. They're the ones who can pick up quickly on those things. So to me, for me to have a comfortable, uh, peaceful dinner at night with my family, even though if I have sick patients in, the, in my facility, is, is because I believe that I have very competent team members, aka CNAs, who are there to take care of my patients. So, so the, the value they bring to me is not just professional, it is also personal that, I mean, I don't have to be the building every day because I can just call and find out what's going on because I believe my team, I trust my team. And I'll tell you that one of the biggest reasons why doctors have and nurse practitioners over the phone are sending so many people out to the hospital is because they are not being able to build a trusting relationship between them and the, their CNA and their nursing partners. So having an effective, uh, trustworthy CNA who has been in the building for many, many months and years, who really does their job and understanding the patient gives so much mental peace to other team members so that they can uh, peacefully provide the right evidence-based decisions over the phone and not just send every patient out because they don't trust the healthcare system. So, 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 so there's a lot of reasons why, you know, a good patient care delivery depends upon, uh, you know, and a competent and uh, trustworthy CNA. Um, I don't, we didn't intend to, and it's not about COVID, but I think it'd be remiss if we didn't pick your brain a little bit about how you were feeling at the beginning. Um, you know, I'm certain you were very concerned about your patients, but I'm certain you were also concerned about the staff. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you feel nursing homes were so left out? Well, to me, I mean, I've been, a, believe me, like many of us, many, many of us, and shame on anyone who is not <laughs> reflecting on this, right? If we, I mean, I would give ourselves not a very high score as a country on how we took care of our seniors and our older people and our staff in our nursing home. We just, we, got, we don't get a good grade. I mean, being that it is 21st century and that we are the most powerful nation in the world, I don't give ourselves a very high grade on it. And it's not just me. I mean, if you look at publications coming in General Internal Medical, uh, Medical Association, I mean, you look at all those analysis, we uh, do not, did not do a great job. So I think we just don't. And, and one of the reasons for that, that comes out of my reflection, and I've read a lot about from other experts' reflection, is that we, do we really value our seniors? Have we been able to create an age-friendly environment in our country? Have we really, really 
put the resources and the effort that was needed to create a age-friendly environment in our country. So because we didn't, we just never valued our nursing homes, right? I mean, why in the 21st century we have to deal with an environment where we have, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, three or more residents in one uh, room and so forth. So I think infrastructure-wise, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and, you know, we were not set up for good infection control practices in our country in regard to nursing home care. So I think we were found short uh, a lot of those places. But then what saved our butts, honestly, was the commitment of the front line. The hours, uh, you know, the, uh, the courage they showed, the commitment they showed, the resolve they showed. I mean, I saw huddles happening where people were just coming together every morning and really, you know, uh, using, um, uh, supporting each other. And uh, so a lot of good, uh, positive uh, heroism at the front line really honestly saved, saved our butt. But in regards to us kind of quickly getting the resources that were needed as a country, for us recognizing how big of an issue COVID was right away in the beginning, we took time on that. Getting the PPE where it was needed, uh, we took time in that. Getting testing supplies where they were needed, be, uh, we took time in that. So I think we're just, we're lagging behind uh, quite a bit in that. So that created a lot of, uh, you know, gaps in the front line. But man, did our front lines kind of come together and, and the role the CNS played uh, becoming not just a, a higher level and more available clinician, uh, sorry, uh, professional there at the front line, but also becoming a family member to how many residents there and then helping their nurse partners in doing their job, holding these cameras so that telehealth can be done. And, you know, there's just countless, countless roles uh, which were played by them, which helped us, you know, uh, make sure that we saved tons and tons of lives because of that. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, as you look to the future, should we be overly concerned about a big resurgence? Uh, do you think we'll go through this again with the variants? And or do you have any insight on that at this time? You know, I have, uh, Lori, I have been and we have been, we the leaders who are assigned to really, really kind of get our act together now and do a good job with geriatrics in general and nursing home, we have so much better we can do as healthcare leaders. And we have been asking so much of our frontline. I hate to ask one more thing, but I really want to ask one thing from our frontline. We need to get vaccinated. Honestly, I have come at it from so many different angles and I've reviewed any, any piece of data I can get my hands on and any scientific thing that has come out and multiple perspectives on this. I think there's one thing which I really, really have to request of our frontline and the CNS that they are going to play a huge role in our future or response to the pandemic based on their decision-making around the vaccine. So it is my request of them to be to believe in the science. The science is clear. Uh, I don't know how many hundred million people have been vaccinated and outcomes are tremendously positive uh, for people who are getting vaccinated. Outbreaks are so less, uh, disease intensity and severity so less, hospitalizations are so less, deaths are so limited when people get vaccinated. To me, that is the quickly, the first quick short-term answer that please get vaccinated. It only won't protect you and your families, but will immensely protect uh, our residents also. So I think to me, that's a quick answer. But from policy point of view, yes, we have to look at our infrastructure. We have to look at our buildings. We have to look at uh, infection mitigation uh, technologies like, uh, you know, uh, infrared and uh, ultrasound and uh, copper. And there's just so many different things we need to do from scientific point of view. Uh, and then, of course, for the well-being of our CNA, as you were talking about the wages, uh, their, their place in the team, acknowledging them in the team. I mean, there are just so many things we have to do. Well, uh, yes, the, indeed. And, you know, the, the vaccine confidence or hesitancy, however we want to place it, uh, I just want to take a second. I know you're uh, past president of uh, AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. And uh, AMDA was instrumental early in the year in helping us develop education that our members could trust around the country and, and having a single source to go to. So thank you on behalf of us and uh, for AMDA. The, um, <clears throat> is there any place where our members could go and get trusted data? 
around the uh, what what has been studied since the vaccine has been given to millions. You know, what did we the first vaccinations came out in December, did they? November? Yes, right. Exactly. So yeah, the dissemination started in December. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's many, many places. Uh, I mean, I, one place I would recommend not to get your usual education is at from Instagram and Facebook. Man, 80 to 90 percent. Yeah. Literature shows that more than 80 percent of the information being found on social media is absolutely junk and inaccurate. So that's one thing where I would not place. I would not go is, so, is really social media. Uh, but yeah, I mean, simple one, CDC. CDC has all the resources uh, you want to get and learn about the vaccine. I mean, they have information directed towards physicians, towards families, towards nurses, towards CNAs, towards people. So, I mean, they all categorize in different, depending upon what who the audience is. So that's number one. Uh, and AHRQ, uh, Agency of Healthcare Research Quality, uh, uh, released uh, uh, in collaboration with the Health and Human Agency uh, Services, uh, released their, uh, their guide on uh, vaccine hesitancy. You mentioned AMDA already, but you know, forget about all of that. I think a good credible place is to go to your medical director. Uh, exactly. As you, as you, Lori already mentioned that historically, uh, we, you know, we have a, had a great relationship between medical directors and and CNAs and and uh, and NACA. So let's utilize that, right? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, there are many, many reasons where uh, resources where our CNS can get very credible information. If you could change anything about geriatric medicine, what would you change? Oh my God. I think we are, it's not about changing geriatric medicine. It's about we practicing it more. Right. I mean, so I think, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, what we know about geriatrics and where, you know, there's a lot of, the thing is that, again, because of that dank, ageistic culture we have had in our society, where we have not really, really uh, treasured our older people enough, we have not invested in the research and the science we needed promptly. Uh, you know, people are, you know, people with mild dementia who are older are easily uh, excluded from studies, right? That way we just not have a good solid evidence based around that. So I think that we need to do better. But again, we have such good geriatric principles and evidence available. We just don't practice it, right? One example is what we're talking about today. Are we valuing our every single team member on the geriatric team? No, we are not. We are not really benefiting from the insight CNAs can bring on a team. Uh, so we need to do better in regards to teamwork and making sure that we have formal systems uh, of, of getting uh, input from everyone. The other place where we can do better in regards to geriatrics is we know that we all need to be incentivized if patient does well, not just the corporate, not just the medical director, not just the DON, not just the administrator. Every single team member has to be socially acknowledged and financially incentivized when outcomes are good. So to me, better alignment with uh, incentives and the right quality measures. And number two is better teamwork uh, and valuing team members are two areas which I would uh, point to. Excellent. Well, um, <clears throat> that has, that's been quite helpful. And I, and I really did hate to turn it to COVID and the vaccine, but it is CNA week and that was a great appeal. I appreciate you for adding that in. Uh, that's my hope as well. And I have to tell you, I was skeptical. We didn't know in November if, I mean, I didn't know if I was going to take the vaccination, but I had a heart attack in 2019. And, um, you know, I did the research and I used AMDA, the medical directors, because that's who I f felt had the best interests of our residents and the staff in our nursing homes and around the country in elder care. Um, I did think of another question, and now it slipped my mind um, that I thought would just be a, a great one for you. But uh, since I can't bring that one to my forefront right away, what um, talk a little bit about, uh, oh, I know what it was, infection control. CNAs are required to have only one hour of something called compliance education for infection control. If you could wave a magic wand... How many hours do you think a CNA needs to have in infection control, prevention, treatment, whatever the words we want to tack onto it? Yeah, I think uh, I am not very fond of, I mean, uh, you know, of course, I follow all compliance and regulatory requirements. I'm all for that, but I'm not just very fond of it. I don't think, I don't think in the end it's the regulation or the compliance that makes you provide high quality care. It is your internal motivation 
that drives you to provide good quality care. Yeah. So if, if you want to be average or just average, yeah, that's fine. Compliance and regulatory, everything helps, right? But again, it it does I mean in this 21st century for a country like US, which believes in the best of the best in everything, man, we should be shooting for stars in infection control. So to me, it's not going to be about one hour, 10 hour education. It's going to be about every team member being a role model. And I'm going to start with where we need to start. The physician. I don't ever say that physician are a leader of the team, but man, they are the role model when it comes to good infection control practices. And whenever I meet with my medical director, I remind them like, hey man, I don't care what you preach, how many PowerPoint slides you teach your CNA. I want you to be a role model. I want you to do what you want them to do, right? So physicians still, for whatever reason, again, I, I, I think it's, a, it's just a, it's, it's a fluke that all physicians get that much attention. I don't, I don't think we're anything special. We just get paid a little bit more. But to me, for whatever reason, physicians do get looked at as role models. And I think we are falling short. We definitely were falling short Look at all the studies. We're we're not doing a good job doing infection control. Uh, you know, uh, washing our hands regularly, making sure that we are entering the room with the right PPE in isolation room. We were falling short. So, to me, I'm gonna just really started with us physicians that man we can do so much better job of being role models because then who needs the education right i mean if you see your team members doing the right thing you want to do the right thing right so to me it really falls upon us being better team members and then yes education is going to going to going to going to play a role but again we have to start teaching each other while we provide care. And at Signature Healthcare, I'm really on a mission along with my chief nursing officer and quite a few other leaders that since the pandemic, we have realized that our nursing homes have to be learning nursing homes, which means like in hospitals, in an academic hospital, what happens, Lori? Every single opportunity to provide care is what? It is to teach care. Right? right. There's nobody right. alone providing care. There's somebody learning while you're providing care. So I think we have so much care delivered on nursing homes, but we barely, maybe less than 5% of the time, we use it as a learning opportunity. So I think instead of relying on this compliance-based educational module, yeah, yeah, we have to do all of that to make people happy. But really, if we are internally motivated to do well, well, we have to learn from each other. We have to start accompanying people when we are weighing them. You know, when we are looking at wounds, we have to bring like, let me show you a wound. Like this is how it looks like. Hey, this patient's heart sounds uh, wet lungs. Let me make you hear what wet lungs. So we have to take every opportunity as physicians to become a role model in practicing good infection control. But everyone on the team has to become a learning uh, team member so that others can learn from it. So really we have to turn around towards a better learning environment and nursing homes. Personally, if you're ever in a position where you're not feeling valued, what do you do to, to recenter yourself and understand your own value? What, because I would imagine that we would all do, you know, similar things. So I call it a metric, uh, which nobody measures formally in our healthcare system, but I measure it for myself personally in everything I do. And to me, that metric is the most important. And I absolutely rely on it. And, and I teach it to all my, all my students. How well do you sleep at night? So every night you go home, you reflect on what impact did you have today? And if the answer is none, well, that's concerning. Well, yeah, of course, there will be days that you, you won't have an opportunity to really have an impact. But if this is happening every day, then that's a concern. So I think it all starts with self-reflection. No matter how much the world values us, no matter how much they pay us, no matter what happens in the world, we all have to be sincere to ourselves first, that the way we do our job, we enjoy it. And then we are able to go home and look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what? I was worth something today. And that work does not come out of pills. It does not come out of tests. It comes out of making a patient smile, making their life quality go up, and really bringing value to a family who's just bamboozled by so much regulatory garbage, uh, jargon, and, and medical jargon. Families are just overwhelmed, right? So they, there's so much value in just making them understand something as little as it may be. So I think I envy CNAs because, man, they, out of us all healthcare team members, they have the best seat on the table to connect with the patients and bring them value through a smile, by, clear, by clarifying some concept, giving them their hand and their support when they needed it. And let me tell you, you were talking about value because I always kind of try to put value on myself and I get bored and disappointed if I don't see that value, no matter how much I get paid. That's not the point. Uh, it's really, I have to pass that my personal test every night that I was worthy of something today. And I'll tell you the funny story. 
I always felt jealous of CNAs in a positive way because, you know, whenever I left my nursing home, the last thing when I was leaving out of my nursing home at West Park was what? Right before the door was this big board of all the letters and cards which families shared. And honestly, Lori, I every day looked my name on that board and zero, zero, the six years I worked there, four years, five years, zero times my name showed up on that board. And guess whose name was showing up on those boards? All the CNAs. Awesome. And I was so dang jealous. I'm like, what can I do? And then I realized that families could care less about the skills I bring to the table. They, I mean, they think they're important, but that's not what makes them happy. Just because I control their blood pressure better was not the source of their happiness, right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're satisfied that their blood pressure is well controlled, but they don't feel it. Me giving them the right antibody, like, yeah, that will make them live longer, but it's not the source of their today's happiness. What was their source of day-to-day -day happiness? Somebody got them the right beverage when they were eating. Somebody warmed up their milk, which was too cold. Their, their meal had gotten cold and somebody did the extra step. And who was doing all those jobs? The nursing and the CNS. And their names were always showing up on those boards. So, man, CNS are valued by patients more than anybody else, honestly. I mean, do healthcare leaders value them? I do not know about that. Do policymakers value them? I hope they do. But, man, you are valued by the customers and the patients. No question. And oftentimes those are the folks that can't always tell them. And if we think about this, Dr. Nazir, this whole pandemic, CNAs have been without one group's constant recognition, and that's the families. Yeah. Most of our recognition comes from the families. They'll hunt you down in the break room or the linen room or wherever you might be to thank the CNA for how great dad looks today or how you know well mom's doing or and so that's been, uh, so this year, more than any year, we needed to show CNAs a great deal of love and make, make, make sure they know they're important. But it is very hard. I can remember it's been a number of years since I did patient care as a CNA. But I know most nights I, wa I clocked out at 11 and went home. Uh, no overtime was allowed, but I always know, knew that there was more I could have done and should have done if there'd only been more time. I agree. And so um, last uh, early on in uh, CNA week in my last webinar, I told them that when all you can do is all you can do, all you can do is enough. Would you agree with that? Well, yes, I agree with that. But I mean, again, you have to then you still have to push the healthcare system to really help make it easy for you and make it better for you. So you have to have a vo voice. So I think, Lori, in that regard, what you're doing for the CNAs is priceless. And I think that regard, having NACA and having an organization, and I know how hard it has been for you to like continue this journey. Uh, but finally, I'm just so happy that your efforts and what you're bringing to the table is, rec is being recognized. So yes, we all have to have a voice. We have to continue to have ask more. Uh, we have to be a squeaky wheel. So again, we don't have to do it selfishly. Because, you know, if we get paid, if the CNS get paid better, guess who benefits? Our residents, my mom, Absolutely. my parents, myself, when I'm in the nursing home, I will get benefit from it. So it's really the whole in, the whole society wins if, if we have our CNS who are more comfortable in their jobs, they're being more valued and so forth. So we have to have a voice for that. Excellent. Well, we're running down to where I'm going to have uh, Matt or someone look at the chat and the Q&A and see if we have anything we need to answer. But uh, while he does that, I'm just going to turn it over to you to give any final thoughts or remarks or whatever you'd like to say to CNAs across America. We have members in every state but Alaska. So All right. this could be seen everywhere. Awesome. Well, I do want to give you, uh, remember I told you that I started with a survey and my first question was, why do you what you do? And I'll tell you that I stopped asking that question after like five uh, visits because it was pointless because I got the same exact answer from every single CNA and it was spooky. And the answer was, these are my people. And, and every single time I would ask that question, honestly, the CNAs would look at me like if I have two heads and they're like, why the heck did you even ask that question? What else would I be doing? These are my people. What would, where would they be with all my help? They are my family. So to me, that was just the most heartwarming thing I ever did. That epiphany for me that, man, this healthcare system has survived, even though we have not done well in terms of policy and resources. This healthcare system has survived in reasonably reasonable shape because we have one of the most passionate people at the helm of it. 
So to me, that was just the most eye-opening thing. So much so that when I became the president of AMDA three years ago, I was able to share that quote as my opening statement. To me, that was just one of the most inspiring things I heard. Excellent. Anything else from the survey that you want to report or was that the... Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, other things were other, other things were like innovation. No, you know, we sometimes feel that the CNS just want to keep th- the way things are in terms of what they do. No, they're like open for like more education, more resources, more innovation, technology. And uh, I got so many new ideas from those CNS. I always kind of left open ended that if you had one technology you, you could create with a magic wand, what would that be? So uh, an idea, for example, came out of that. They said, why can't we have a tablet on our forearm? And then as we are providing care, we can do our ADLs and everything right from the tablet right there. We don't have to go back and remember anything. And also, a lot of great ideas came from that. And we are actually impl- implementing many of those ideas. Excellent. That is great to hear. I hope you'll publish something on how CNAs were instrumental in assisting. Um, now, I recall back to our last meeting, actually our first and last meeting, which was so... Uh, so much fun. Um, I know you have, uh, he, uh, Dr. Nazir and I are going to one of these days, we haven't been really funny today, but one of these days we're going to do a geriatric uh, stand-up tour or something where he and I- That's the bucket list, Lori. Cut, cut loose. And he doesn't know it, but I've already been doing it for a number of years. Like We just have to team up now. But um, I recall that you had a few things. Uh, if nothing else, talk to us about innovation. I know you're all about technology, innovation, and making life, uh, making things better through technology. Is there anything on the horizon that uh, we might take advantage of someday? Many, many, many things, of course, to the horizon. Thanks God, because the thing is that we have such constraints in our country and in the worldwide around good geriatric uh, care. For example, we only have 6,000 geriatricians when we, as you said, and we need more than 35,000, right? Look at our nursing force. How short are we on nursing? You, you know, how, how short are we on CNAs and all that? So to me, I mean, if we don't innovate and think about a technology, we will, 10 years from now, we actually will be in worse shape because we have a lot of people getting older and whatnot. So that's where we have to use artificial intelligence. So I think automation, to me, the dumbest thing is, which we unfortunately we have to do, and I understand that, but to me, 10 years back, we will look at it like, oh my God, that was dumb, is that we provide care and then we go record it. So we waste so much time duplicating. Not only we provide care, but then we have to go and digitally record it, which wastes so much healthcare worker times. To me, the number one innovation, which is being looked at is how can we use sensors and how can we use microphones to really just capture automatically what kind of care was provided. And then it can be documented using AI so that all CNAs and nurses have to do like, look at it like, yep, yep, I approve. And they can be done within five five seconds and documenting everything. To me, that is going to save so much time. The other thing is robotics is really helping CNAs, all those hard things like, you know, they have to lift people and, you know, harm their backs and uh, all those kind of things. Uh, it's going to be very important. And then uh, finally, one of my favorite things is, is really bringing Alexa-based technologies in patients' rooms so that everything will be automated in terms of patients, what patients need. Nobody has to run to the room. So there will be a lot of through robotics and Alexa-based technologies. CNS will have so much help in term, in forms of uh, assistance helping them. Wow. Well, we're going to have to have you back to talk more about that as it become as more and more becomes available in the future. Uh, Matthew, I noticed. I believe we did have at least one question in the chat when I went back. Have uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So let me go ahead and ask uh, that question. Um, so as you mentioned, Doctor Nazir. Uh, you mentioned education. Uh, what are your thoughts on educating staff and CNAs to improve quality of care? Do you go to the QA meetings and educate staff? What is your approach to this? She thinks that education is very important and thanks you both. This was Jamie Smith. Hey, Jamie, uh, great question. Uh, uh, if people know me and as Lori, you said, I'm a big believer in innovation. I am done with traditional education. So to me, education means so much different than how we know education. To me, uh, you know, 40 PowerPoint slide uh, education over cold pizza is useless. Uh, But unfortunately, that continues to be our number one way of educating. Uh, Checklist education so that you can just get compliance points is not education for me. To me, education is inspirational, role model, uh, care-based education. So to me, we have to 
uh, energize or introduce the process of grand rounding in our nursing home. That signature, that's our number one initiative. Every week, teams come together. They take two or three patients with complex medical issues, and they all go together in the leadership of the CNA and say, and go talk to the patient and then learn from each other's perspective. There's no teacher. Everybody's a learner. The doctor is a learner because they have so much to learn from the CNA. I published this model. It's called, the, and you can find it on JAMDA, which is one of the journals from AMDA. It's called the patient as the CEO of their own health. So that model basically has a lot on that, uh, how we can create a learning environment in a nursing home and Whenever care is provided, we need to teach each other. There's just no other way of providing competencies in nursing homes. We are not going to be able to do it through PowerPoints or once a month quality improvement meetings and things of that sort. Excellent. Excellent. And then I, I do have one more question. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit with this one. This is from Berthy uh, Iguo. Um, what motivates you every day to, to keep on going. So what, what, what motivates you, Dr. Nazir? And then I'm going to throw it to Lori as well. Um, what motivates you guys to keep going every single day? Yeah, I'm happy to take it. The easy answer is the team members. I mean, I, the thing is that I have been blessed to be given the best possible education experiences. Now a place as a chief medical officer, past president of AMDA, I have so much pressure to pay back to this country and to our seniors and to our team members. So I feel that pressure every day that motivates me because otherwise I'm going to be a total failure. Honestly, if I cannot be a contributor to changing healthcare so that our seniors and our older people can get a better care, I'm going to be personally disappointed in my own self. So it's a very selfish motivation. I don't want to look back at the age of whenever I'm passing away and like, man, I was given all the luxury and ability to do it. And I was not able to do it to me. That is the biggest motivation. We have very motivated team members. We have all the resources in the world. If we cannot really bring in the world's best healthcare system, then who can? So to me, that pressure keeps me motivated. Well, and my response is uh, not nearly as eloquent, but my response is every, um, the only way I can sleep at night is to ensure that residents have CNAs and CNAs have residents, because I believe what benefits one benefits both, no matter who gets what. And, um, Every day that I know there's potentially a resident without a CNA or a CNA that is taking care of 47 residents, I feel inspired and motivated to get up and, and try to create new nursing assistance and educate and support those we have. So our residents will have care providers. Wow. That was amazing, Lori. Well, I mean, it's, you know, we've tried to do some math around here and we know there's several hours that can go by in a 24 hour period where residents not touched at all. And we want to try to try to do something about that. And so I think I uh, mentioned to you, Dr. Nazir, that we are getting ready to launch the National Institute of CNA Excellence, which will be a total online platform from start to finish. And we hope you'll be involved with us on that as well, considering all the innovation you have and love. And we would uh, not want to miss out on that. Matt, was that all the questions? Uh, that was all the questions, but I do want to encourage uh, the people watching on Facebook and Zoom to um, check out our website, www.nacacna.org. Um, you can find a lot of good resources on there free. You can also find membership information. And then we have a special page for CNA Week. I know we are wrapping up, but if you haven't seen the video that the NACA team put together for CNA Week... Um, immediately after this webinar, just, just go ahead and go and watch it because that's it is an amazing video. <laughs> Whoever did that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Yep. Good step. All right. And Dr. Nazir, I did, I was able to go through the chat and uh, we have a lot of great comments. Uh, people have appreciated this. I've appreciated having time with you and sharing it with our members and um, if we, uh, uh, I believe that was the end of the question. So what parting words would you like to say as we close this out? Well, I just offer you my services. I offer you physician partnerships. We are here for you. I, I believe in the physician uh, practitioner CNA partnership. This is where the healthcare system really, really can kind of catapult into a new zone. Of course, nurses and dietitian, everybody has to play a role, but those partnerships already exist. But I think we have not really reaped the benefit from really focusing on this physician CNA partnership. So I offer myself anything I can do to charge that up 
uh, and really, really excited about your center of excellence. So look forward to contributing in any way. And, and, and just want to thank you, every single one of the CNFs who have just done, given their hearts out to the care and protection of our resident in the front line. Uh, I salute you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Nazir. And I feel the exact same way. We're coming down. This is the last day of CNA week. We've had a pretty robust week here at NACA. Uh, I have taken some notes in listening to Dr. Nazir and the members and I will be getting together to talk about how we can engage medical directors more and be a part of that. Because I think mostly CNAs are probably seeing themselves as uh, not necessarily no one told us we couldn't talk to the doctors. We may have just assumed we couldn't talk to the doctors. So we're going to do some work on that so we can improve or uh, not improve, but certainly create relationships in that form. CNAs, you have a great deal of value. Uh, even if you don't feel it from others, you've got to provide it to yourself because there's not many people in this world. They say CNAs are special because you do a job other people can't do. I don't buy that for a minute. I believe you're special because you do a job other people won't do. And that's what makes you special. So I hope you've had a good CNA week. Reach out to us anytime we can be of assistance to you. We stand to serve and support CNAs any way we can. So with that, Matthew, I'm going to turn it back. And I believe this concludes our webinar, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Arif. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.